There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. May the beauty of those words from the Apostle Paul recorded in Romans chapter 8 give you comfort and joy. May they remind you of the grace and the mercy and the peace that God has placed in your hearts. There is now no condemnation. The verdict is in. This morning we want to focus on that judgment of our Savior Jesus. We'll look at the first lesson. Words the Apostle Paul had for the Thessalonians. Uh, Let us begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, bless our time together today and comfort our hearts with the announcement of the verdict, not guilty, that we have through faith in Christ. May we continue in that knowledge and may we concentrate our efforts on sharing this wonderful message with others that they also might be properly and eagerly prepared for that wonderful day. In your name we pray this. Amen. Everyone knew that one of two things was going to happen. Either there was going to be an end to that 68-year drought or the 108-year drought. Loyal baseball fans of the Cleveland Indians and the Chicago Cubs enjoy the last couple of weeks to a degree, I suppose. And, And even as an Indians fan, There was this hope, right, even though the odds were stacked against him. So much so was this hope that one of the Cleveland Indians fans took the Cleveland Indians logo and the words 2016 champs and tattooed it on his forearm. Now, either he's going to have a scar the rest of his life because he got rid of it, or he's going to try and figure out how to explain his loyalty, excitement, uh, maybe a little above what it should have been. Most fans were a little more realistic uh, in their excitement. They knew one of two things would happen, and they planned accordingly. Maybe being one of those fans, you decided, well, I'm not going to stay up all night to see who wins this historic Game 7. You realize that the, the outcome was not going to change the course of history. But if you did decide to stay up, which I didn't, I should have stayed up another hour, I suppose, but if you were going to stay up, then you'd have to understand that the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat would have kept you up perhaps even later. So maybe there was wisdom of just going to bed. But to me, that's what's the excitement about competition, competitive sports, is not knowing. Right? And you sit on the edge of your seat waiting to see how things are going to turn out. And, and then you get to tell, tell stories about what you thought about that key play or uh, the key word that someone used to sort of turn the tide of the game or the event. To me, that's sort of the excitement of, of competition. But maybe you and I would much rather know what the outcome is, right, in a lot of things. Just imagine if we knew who was going to win the game or lose the game, or, or imagine you knew how that new job was going to pan out before you took your first day. Or, or maybe you knew exactly how things were going to turn around to, if, you know, if you decided to move. Um, or, or maybe it, it's a matter of knowing how your children's lives were going to turn out. Right? Wouldn't it be nice to know the rest of the story, how things are going to end? As confident as we might be in what's going to happen, there's always, I think, in our minds, this sort of ounce of doubt, uh, maybe a little bit of uncertainty, because that's life in a sinful world. We're not in control, and to a degree, we have very little to say in how things turn out. We can't control how people react to us and and what they do. Each morning, you and I wake up, and the game of life resumes. We roll out of bed, but we realize it's more than a game, and we realize there's a lot more to our lives, what we do, the decisions we make, uh, much more so than the World Series or even a presidential election. From the past experience, we've learned that it takes a lot of extra sleep, Uh, To play the game of life, it takes a well-balanced diet, exercise, hard work, but also a game plan, right? Because we know there's obstacles and challenges to overcome, and we know from experience that there are going to be curveballs thrown at us. 
and we're going to have to know what to do. And if history repeats itself, we're going to have those moments when we don't like what God has to say to us, or we're going to, as hard as we try, we're still going to mess up. And when history does repeat itself, we realize the need for a humble, repentant attitude in life. With those things in mind, the Apostle Paul encouraged young Pastor Timothy to continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. He said to Timothy, because you know from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. Through the Bible, God commands us to keep growing in our understanding of God, the world in which we live, our sinful natures. There's the enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion. There's those false teachers who masquerade, who disguise themselves as fellow sheep of the flock. They present themselves as shepherds, loving shepherds who have your best interests in mind. And and we know from scriptures and from experience that there are times in life when it seems like the world is winning. The, the, The evil, unbelieving people, they're getting away with murder. We know at times in our lives that it will seem like the believers are losing. That we're missing out on life, that we're being pitied by all the people around us because they get to live life to its fullest. They don't have to say no to temptation or the desires that they have. The Bible warns us to not fall away from what we have been taught about that precious blood of Christ shed on the cross. So much so, the Apostle Paul told the Galatians, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Why such strong words? Well, there's a lot at stake. The the consequences are eternal. To take God seriously when he commands us to grow in our faith, to take God seriously when he warns us of uh, keeping our guard up, It's more than prudent and wise. It's critical. It's crucial. Because the devil is going to try and win at all costs. He either is going to work at planting doubt in your hearts as to the truths of God's word. And and we remember what he asked Eve. Did God really say these things? And if it's not that, the devil is constantly working to plant despair in your hearts. Are you sure God's going to forgive you? Have you looked in the mirror lately? That's not really what a child of God looks like. The Thessalonians were struggling in their faith because people were telling them things that weren't true, but they were believing it. And then, as they walked away from God, they also felt this guilt because they realized that they had turned on their Savior they realized that they were in a heap of trouble. What wonderful words the Apostle Paul had for them. He was reminding them, as we are reminded, we already know who wins the game of life. Paul said, God will pay back the wicked, and God will give you relief. In the meantime, though, as we wait for the last judgment, The days go on and on and on, like extra innings of a baseball game. And we ever wonder if it's going to be over, right? The pressure and the stress, the anxiety of what it means to be a Christian in a sinful world, and and the pressures that we have from the world around us to sort of cave in. The energy it takes to follow God's plan to carry out the calling that he's given to us. This morning when uh, uh, I was visiting with Mia and Tessa before I came back over to church, Mia all of a sudden asked me this question, Dad, what happens if the president doesn't keep all the promises that he makes to get elected? And I said, well, unfortunately, not much happens to the president. And uh, 
we could have had a much longer discussion on that question. But when we talk about current cultural and world affairs, there's sort of this dreadfulness in our voice and in our hearts. And I always come back to this one prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And that's what we just sort of saying in one of those verses in response to God's announcement of forgiveness, his absolution. Oh, Jesus Christ, do not delay, but hasten our salvation. We often tremble on our way in fear and tribulation. Your saints are waiting patiently. Come soon, Redeemer. Make us free from every evil. Amen. Right? So shall it be. We sing and we pray. Comfort and joy, right? We already know how the game is going to end. Who is going to win? But if we admit things about ourselves, we admit that this knowledge sometimes leads us to be sort of complacent and and maybe even overconfident. Our sinful nature has a way of taking this wonderful news of victory and sort of excusing our sins because we're going to be in heaven. Or we learn from the Apostle Paul, we're more than conquerors, we're super conquerors through Christ. So we are invincible and untouchable. Well, those types of sinful uh, attitudes and thoughts also lead to idleness. To know who wins, how the game ends, sometimes leads us to ignore the work to which God has called us. Victory through Christ, through his death on the cross, looks a certain way. And the Apostle Paul describes that in 2 Corinthians 5. Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised to life. He has committed to us, he's entrusted to us, this message of reconciliation that God is not counting men's sins against them because he held Jesus accountable. And Paul ends that section by saying, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We already know who is going to win. But there's also things for us to do while we wait for that day, right? that wonderful day of judgment. Jesus used the parable to teach us not only to be ready always because we don't know when that day is coming, but also to faithfully use the gifts to faithfully manage the things that have been given to us. And what's been given to you, faith. So there's, there's this command to faithfully nurture your faith properly nurture it each and every day through the word and through the sacraments. But there's also this need to faithfully manage this knowledge that you have of Jesus, which God intends for you to share. And Jesus sort of highlights what this knowledge is all about as he says at the end of the parable, to him who has, more will be given. And the point there is our human knowledge, our human understandings can't comprehend the divine and the eternal. It's hard for us to grasp exactly what heaven is going to be like, but he says to everyone who has right, this gift of faith and knowledge, more will be given beyond your imagination. Knowing how things will end produces in us this desire to follow God's plan, his game plan for our lives. And that game plan is to faithfully invest the faith that God has given to us and the talents he's given to us to invest it in ministry, to invest it in serving others, caring for souls who need Jesus. And why? Because we already know who wins. We don't know how long the game is going to go, and we don't know specifically who is on the team that wins, but as the front cover of Revolton says, God is just, right? No one's going to sway God, no one is going to buy God out, right? Nothing's going to tip the scales now that Jesus has died on the cross and paid for your sins. Nothing in God's word is ever going to change. 
So God says, I will pay back trouble to those who trouble you, and I will give relief to you who are troubled. I will punish those who do not know me and who do not believe or obey the gospel of Jesus. The rest of us, we will marvel at the sight of our Savior on that wonderful day as we are excited to see him and to hear those wonderful words, not guilty. You and I know already who is going to win. We know through faith that we are part of that winning team because of Christ. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Content if maybe today isn't the day. But as uh, we sing in hymn 337, delay not, delay not, right? We excitingly, eagerly look forward to that wonderful day because we know the verdict. May that final judgment that's already been carried out, may it lead us to continue in what we know about Jesus as we grow in our faith, but may we also continue to concentrate on sharing it to faithfully invest this knowledge in the hearts and lives of those who don't know Jesus so that they can eagerly look forward to that wonderful day like you and I do. May God grant us a, a, a joyful heart as we share the wonderful news of that not guilty verdict in Christ. God grant us that in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. <clears throat> the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding will continue to guard and keep your hearts through faith in Christ as you look forward to that wonderful day of judgment. <clears throat>